Okay, we're going to look at theme 4E. This uh, deals with the topic of religious experience, very much from a Christian perspective, and looks particularly at the charismatic movement, and also um, takes on with that the Pentecostal movement as well. But mainly we deal with the charismatic movement in this theme. So let's start with an introduction to the charismatic movement. So the traditional view of Christian worship tends to be that it's quite formal in nature. A bit like this picture up here on the top right. You've got road processions, you've got organ music, chanting, singing hymns, um, people kneeling, reciting prayers, standing up at the same time, sitting down at the same time, etc, etc. Certainly in the traditional Roman Catholic Anglican services, definitely in the Orthodox Church, that would be the case. Very liturgical service that follows a set pattern with a set um, order of service. However, the reality in some traditional churches is the opposite to all this. Uh, so in these sort of churches, you will get people spontaneously lifting their hands in the air, as you can see here. Um, you'll get sort of swaying about soft rock music. You might even get people babbling, um, which a, lang a language which is sometimes called speaking in tongues. Um, when they have the, um, the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, uh, there might be acts of healing that occur afterwards. Um, you might get laying on of hands, um, prayers for God to heal people. You might be invited to a prayer meeting afterwards, which focuses on learning about the power of the Spirit. And basically, if that's the case, you've just encountered what is known as the charismatic movement. It's not a particular denomination. It's more a movement about how one worships and how one uses the Holy Spirit within worship. So the word charismata comes from the Greek and um, literally translated it means gifts of grace. And charismatic Christians are basically those who believe and practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit today. So they believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit weren't just um, something that was assigned to the disciples 2000 years ago at Pentecost, but they're very real, very true experiences that can be experienced by any believer in today's society. So arguably the movement's been around since Christianity started, but really the name has only really come into use in recent decades. And then we come into Pentecostal Christians and Pentecostal Christians are sort of their own denomination and they're arguably a more extreme version of charismatic. So um, they place particular emphasis on Pentecost, the festival that remembers the giving of the Holy Spirit, um, a particular emphasis on spiritual gifts, experiencing God even more so than your standard charismatic Christian. Um, and of course the term Pentecostal predates charismatics and the Pentecostalists have been around since at least the early 20th century. So let's go for a brief history of the charismatic movement. Really it sort of kicks off around about the 1960s with this man here, Dennis J. Bennett, who was rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Van Nuys, California. And basically he stood up and recounted his experience of um, feeling the Holy Spirit to his parish. It happened again over, the, over a number of Sundays, including Easter Sunday, and his congregation started to experience these um, spiritual religious experiences. And in the end, he was forced to resign. He didn't fit in with that um, the expected method of worship and he went to another parish and uh, built that up effectively from scratch. The term charismatic was um, first used by the Lutheran minister Harold Bredesen um, and he used it in 1962 to describe what was happening in mainline Protestant denominations. So um, they didn't like the word neo-Pentecostal, you know, new Pentecostalism, 
and he preferred to call it a charismatic renewal in the historic churches. So it was all about, in your traditional churches, there's a renewal, there's a new way of seeing things, a new way of worshipping, being brought into a new age. So the resulting controversy and the press coverage spread an awareness of this emerging movement and the movement grew and it started to embrace other mainline churches where clergy began receiving and publicly announcing their Pentecostal experiences. So these clergy then began holding meetings for seekers and healing services, which included praying over, anointing the sick. And then we get the Catholic charismatic renewal beginning in 1967 at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the movement's grown ever since. And I'll do a little more detail of that later on in this PowerPoint, but really starts in the 60s and has grown ever since then. Although Pentecostalism has been around for considerably more uh, number of years than that, and at least another 60. So let's go down to our Bible references then. So there are several lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. They're mainly in the writings of Paul. Uh, and I've got a table in the next slide that outlines all of these. So what's really clear from all these references, the lists don't agree with each other. It doesn't seem that Paul and others like Peter were trying to produce a standardised list. Um, you know, these are um, spiritual gifts, these aren't. But what they were trying to do, I think, was draw attention to the many different ways that Christian believers experience and can express their beliefs about God and his forgiveness and his grace. It's also interesting to note that in the passages that scholars believe are written later, such as Ephesians and 1 Peter, many of the more miraculous gifts are missing. And so some scholars have thought, well, was the church moving quickly towards a much more formal and regulated order? Well, we simply don't know the answer to this question. However, it is true that in the early centuries of the church, there was the development of formal leadership and very little evidence of the more miraculous gifts in regular practice in Christian worship services. So maybe there's a case there that early on in Christianity they were trying to weed out that sort of thing within worship. So here's the chart. We've got five key passages. Um, they're on the next slide, so don't worry about that. Romans 12, which lists uh, these as spiritual gifts, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, compassion. If they're in more than one, um, one of the references, I've colour coded them for you. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, we get word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing spirits, tongues and interpretation of tongues. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, we get apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healing, helping others, administration and tongues. And these are the two later ones. We start to see apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, and then speaking for God and serving. So here are the passages themselves. So if we look at this one here, Romans 12, 6 to 8, this is Paul writing. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it to proportion his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So I think what Paul's showing there is there are different gifts and people are given these different gifts. It's not something that everyone has. One person may have one, have, have one gift, one may have another. When Paul comes on to write 1 Corinthians, he puts to one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another, and so it continues. So there you have some ideas. Again, Paul sort of implying that different gifts are given to different people. And then later on in 1 Corinthians, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, then prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing. So almost a hierarchy there being put in place by Paul. And then we move to some of these later letters of Paul and then finally Peter.
we get Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service. And then in 1 Peter, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaks, as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God be praised. So those are your key passages. So the most extensive discussion of spiritual gifts is definitely in 1 Corinthians 12, chapters 12 to 14. And remember, Corinthians was the church in Corinth when Paul was writing, it was at a time of crisis. And I think Paul is trying to clear up some issues here. And he's concerned that Paul is concerned that the church becomes aware of the true purpose of spiritual gifts, which is basically to strengthen the church the body of Christ so the church is seen as the body of Christ so I think what he's trying to say is if you have a gift it's not for attaining any individualistic spiritual high they're there to be shared with others so that everyone in the church can have a deeper relationship with God and so what Paul is discouraging I think in 1 Corinthians is a chaotic practice of the gifts where there were multiple and simultaneous displays of tongues or prophecies so that all any observer could hear if they're witnessing some of this worship would be sort of a confused babble of noise. And I think Paul makes it very clear that he thought that speaking in tongues was more fitting for one's own private worship unless that experience was interpreted in an orderly fashion so that everyone could understand what was being communicated. So what was more important to Paul was that people would seek spiritual gifts in an attitude of love and helpfulness for those around them. So let's look at these uh, spiritual gifts in a little more detail so we've got an understanding of what Paul actually meant and Peter actually meant as they talked about them. So I'm not doing all of them, but I'm just going to explain some of the key ones. So when we hear this phrase word of wisdom, what charismatics believe is that God is giving someone a special insight or a piece of wise inspiration that applies to a certain situation. So an example might be uh, King Solomon in the Bible, who had to solve a difficult problem when two women came to him claiming that a certain child was theirs. And uh, his solution was uh, an example of a word of wisdom which solved the problem. And that idea is that God has given him that special insight to solve the problem. When we talk about a word of knowledge, what charismatics believe is going on here is that God is giving a special piece of knowledge to someone that could only have been known by God giving it to you, not something that could be learned. So um, an example might be a specific word of knowledge about a medical problem that the speaker believes God wants to heal, but they have no medical knowledge. Uh, faith is another when we talk about faith all Christians have faith in Jesus and his resurrection but this gift is about having special extra faith for a particular thing or that a particular thing might happen so the example I might give is um, you might have a gift of faith that you will get a certain job or find somewhere to live or meet your life partner etc it's that it's real true belief uh, when we talk about healing, uh, charismatics believe this is where God gives people the authority to supernaturally heal illnesses and pains. So an example might be praying for a person with a back injury to get better by laying on hands of them and it immediately gets better, it gets well. Uh, this is really prominent in the Pentecostal church where copying Jesus, people often command sickness, etc. to be well. And I've used this picture here. This is Heidi Baker an American missionary to Mozambique who claims to see people healed through prayer regularly, including deaf people hearing and the blind seeing. And I've given you a link here to a YouTube interview with her when she talks about this. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then you'll have to just copy down the uh, pause and copy that down. But if you type in Heidi Baker on a search engine, you'll get it without any trouble whatsoever. Um, when we talk about miraculous powers, charismatics believe that these are any miraculous gifts that don't need to fall, up, fall into other categories such as healings. Uh, Michael Green, a British charismatic, believes uh, 
This refers primarily to the power to cast out demons or exorcise people. If so, examples would be the many instances of Jesus casting out demons in the New Testament. And Charismatics would say this still happens today, although more obviously often in non-Western cultures where uh, demonic activity is less, shall we say, hidden. Uh, then we move on to prophecy. Uh, this literally translated means forth speaking, not necessarily foretelling, but charismatics believe this is when God gives people special messages for themselves or others to encourage and or to guide them. An example might be Agabus in the New Testament who ties a belt around Paul to prophesy that if Paul travels to Rome he's going to be arrested. Paul believes him but goes anyway and guess what gets arrested. But modern charismatics believe that God still speaks messages through and to people today such as messages of encouragement and guidance. Contemporary prophecies whenever they do happen are tested by the charismatics against the Bible as to whether they lead to building up people. Okay, and this then leads us on to speaking in tongues. Now the posh word for this is glossolalia. Uh, this is a gift where charismatic Christians believe they're able to pray in or in other language or languages by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, now this can be seen as an angelic language or another human language, even though the speaker doesn't understand it, as in the Pentecost experience in Acts 2. So one practitioner of the gift of tongues is Jackie Pullinger, this lady here. She was a British missionary to Hong Kong and Pullinger claims in her book Chasing the Dragon that through practicing the gift of tongues, Hong Kong heroin addicts who had become new Christians were able to come off heroin without any withdrawal symptoms by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've given you a little YouTube link here to a charismatic pastor, John Piper, and he's um, in conversation speaking about the gifts of tongues. So you can have a look at that. If you just Google people speaking in tongues on YouTube, you'll see that as well. Uh, then we move through to discernment or distinguishing between spirits. And charismatics believe that the gift of discernment helps them to know what kind of spiritual forces are operating in different situations. Because the Bible says there are different kinds of spirits, angels and demons, that can be responsible for different supernatural manifestations. And of course, this gift of discernment or distinguishing between spirits helps Christians tell the difference between an angel and a demon. So an example might be being able to discern whether a particular prof prophetic message is from God or just from the person's imagination or from a more sinister source. And then we go through to interpretation of tongues and charismatics believe that this gift helps them to work out the meaning of a particular message that has been given in tongues. So sometimes in Pentecostal services particularly, someone will share a message in tongues loudly for everyone to hear, and then someone will interpret the message itself. And that's linked to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And Paul talks about the fact that people need to be able to uh, translate the message. So the idea is if it's an angelic language, then another person is given the interpretation or if it's a human language that the speaker doesn't know, uh, there's supposed to be a native speaker of that language somewhere in the room who can translate it. And that then links through to the original Pentecost in Acts 2. I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about this later on in the PowerPoint. So let's have a, look, a little dive into Pentecostalism, an early 20th century movement that believed that miraculous events in the book of Acts with its outpouring of the spirit on the apostles, mass conversion, miracles, healings, etc., should not be seen as a past age, but should be a present reality for the Christian church. And many scholars trace the beginnings of this movement to a temporary Bible school set up by preacher Charles Fox Parham. There he is. And Parham, um, Parham believed uh, that the Holy Spirit was going to descend in a special way on the church. He asked his students to read the book of Acts and to pray they would receive the Spirit. And on the 1st of January 1901, 
One of his students, this lady here, Agnes Ann Osman, is reported to have spoken in tongues and soon after many of the students experienced what they believed to be gifts of the spirit. So in the first few decades of the last century, the various churches that focused on these Pentecostal experiences gradually began to form denomination, and that included uh, denominations such as the Assemblies of God, the Four Square Gospel Church, the Elim Pentecostal Church. Uh, they see lots of those in the United Kingdom. There's an example of one in Wimbledon. That's them practicing um, their Pentecostal religion. And of course, Pentecostal denominations are very evangelical in nature, and evangelicalism is all about converting people to the religion. Alistair McGrath, who we've looked at before, notes four qualities of evangelicalism. He says, uh, basically, these churches say that scripture is the ultimate authority. So going back to Martin Luther there, sola scriptura. Uh, they emphasize the saving death of Jesus on the cross and redemption. They they also said that all people need to have a conversion experience that's when you get phrases like born again christians and the christian faith should be shared through evangelism so it is the duty of these churches to go out and evangelize to bring people into christianity pentecostal denominations also manifest the following qualities that actually distinguish them from evangelical churches. So uh, Pentecostal churches do believe that there's a second baptism, that of the Holy Spirit, and this takes place after conversion. Many Pentecostals believe that speaking in tongues is the confirmation that one has received that second baptism. So you, have, you only received it if you start to speak in tongues. That's somewhat different from what Paul's saying in the Bible. There's a focus on spontaneous worship and healing and a belief that these are the end times, so very eschat eschatological approach, that we are near the end, God is coming, Armageddon's on its way. And Pentecostal churches in the first decades of the 20th century were anti-ecumenical. They're more now in, within the World Council of Churches, but they rarely had anything to do with mainstream traditional churches. And certainly there was an anti-ecumenical tendency in a lot of Pentecostal churches towards the Roman Catholic Church, which was viewed by many of them as outside of Christianity, altogether too formal, too hierarchical and too worldly, and therefore not truly Christian. So let's look at how the charismatic movement has influenced Christianity. So we know that it started really in the 60s with Dennis Bennett. Uh, when that started in California, it began to take a hold with an already established institutes, denominations and to some extent culture. Um, so this guy here, David Duplessis, uh, an Assemblies of God minister, felt called to witness Pentecostalism in ecumenical circles. And he was involved with the World Council of Churches, had audiences of three different popes, and he was known widely as Mr. Pentecost by those in traditional churches. Oral Roberts, a Methodist minister, brought Pentecostalism to a large audience as a pioneer of televangelism. So his fundraising, uh, but his uh, fundraising techniques did earn him much criticism. Uh, we have uh, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, which began in 1953, a very popular movement that brought together businessmen, women and ministers were excluded, with Pentecostal speakers in informal settings, and many from traditional denominations such as Catholicism, Church of England, Methodism, attended those meetings. Popular books such as this one, The Cross and the Switchblade, brought Pentecostal themes to wider audiences. Cross the Switchblades, a true story of a Pentecostal minister who left his comfortable suburban denomination to work with violent street gangs in New York City. Uh, and then um, there's another book that follows on for it uh, about uh, one of the people that uh, David Wilkerson converted, Nikki Cruz. Um, Run Baby Run is, uh, is that. Um, but really good, um, really good read, actually. Not too bad. I have read it. Not too bad at all. Uh, but sold 50 million copies, translated into 30 languages, brought Pentecostal worship to a wider audience. Uh, the first Church of England congregation to declare itself as charismatic was in 1963. 
soon after that, a national network called the Fountain Trust was founded to encourage charismatic worship across denominations in the UK. Fountain Trust voluntarily dissolved in 1980, but it had done a lot of work by then. Um, then we move on to Catholicism. Uh, there's been a charismatic movement in Catholicism. And I think it's really important to put this in the context of Vatican II, which we've already looked at in previous themes. That Vatican II was in 1962 to 65, so right at the start of the charismatic movement. It was focusing on renewal, focusing on renewing the Catholic Church. Pope John the 23rd began Vatican II with a prayer, which was divine spirit, renew your wonders in this our age as in a new Pentecost. So sort of an implication is there. So this openness to renewal is expressed, expressed really clearly in one of the key documents of Vatican II, which again we have looked at in previous uh, PowerPoints, Lumen Gentium, Light to the Gentiles. It asserts the authority of the church, but also the need to be open to new spiritual expressions. So scholars often cite February 67 as the beginning of the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church. A Duquesne University, a Catholic University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, two lecturers have been praying for renewal in the church. They then asked about two students to read, the, about, sorry, asked about 20 students to read The Cross and the Switchblade and to gather for a weekend conference. The group then had dramatic experiences of speaking in tongues and other spiritual gifts. It spread to the University of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame as the Americans call it, which began to host annual conferences with thousands of Catholics attending from around the world. So soon the charismatic movement could be found in Catholic churches on every continent, so quite a dramatic rise. Cardinal Leo Joseph Sunans, a leading voice of Vatican II, was sympathetic to the charismatic movement, represented it to the Pope, and the Catholic Church has uh, recognised the, the charismatic movement in a number of significant ways. In 75, Pope John Paul VI welcomed 10,000 charismatic Christians attending a conference on the charismatic movement. Uh, Pope John Paul II appointed this man here, charismatic priest Raniero Cantalamessa, as a preacher to the papal household. And he is still there. He remains in this role for the current Pope, Pope Francis. In 93, the Vatican officially recognised the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services, the ICCRS, um, and uh, an organisation that promotes charismatic renewal amongst Catholics across the world. And it is currently estimated that between 10 and 15 percent of all Catholics worldwide are involved in charismatic renewal. That is about 150 million people. So let's now look at some other expressions of the charismatic movement. In the 1980s and 90s, many who had been involved in non-charismatic evangelical churches began to, move, began to join the charismatic movement. And the fastest growing Christian movement in Britain in the 1980s was the house church movement. This was also known as restorationism because it had a belief that through it, God was restoring his kingdom in the last day. So again, look at the end times, Armageddon, Jesus coming again. It was composed of both Christians who'd left established denominations, as well as new Christians that had been converted to the religion. They renounced denominations. They had charismatic, charismatic experiences. They met in homes, hence the reason they were called the house church movement. They also formed larger assemblies under those who saw themselves as apostles. And obviously there was a strong eschatological emphasis in the movement with adherents believing they were living in the end times when demonic powers, the power of Satan would be overcome. And there've also been a number of movements, festivals and leaders who've been influential in spreading the charismatic movement amongst evangelical Christians. So this includes the Toronto Blessing, more on that in a minute, the Vineyard Association of Churches and the Spring Harvest Ministries. Uh, Spring Harvest is a non-denominational gathering of Christians of all ages in a festival setting at several locations across the UK. And it's very much known for its charismatic worship and inspiring speakers. So with bearing that in mind, I've given you a few links here.
uh, really good video on the Toronto blessing, which started in Toronto and Canada um, at the church by the airport there and spread across the world. Um, I've given you a link to the Plymouth Vineyard Church, their Facebook page, so you can see uh, a local church, uh, what they believe. And then this is the Spring Harvest website, and here's a clip from Spring Harvest, the Christian festival. So, what are the implications for Christian belief and practice as a result of this charismatic movement coming into starting to become entrenched within Christian worship. Well, those in the charismatic movement believe that Christians outside of their movement could have a much fuller experience of the Holy Spirit if they embraced charismatic principles. So they would believe this could happen in several ways. So we've got speaking in tongues to start off with. So back to glossolalia. Now, there's a debate about the relationship of this word in the context of Acts 2 and in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14. So in Acts 2, the disciples are speaking human languages that they didn't know themselves. So, for example, one may have been speaking in, I don't know, Spanish. Um, now, that's known as xenolalia, xenolalia, speaking in a known language that one has not consciously learned quite important I think for the exam to know the difference between glossolalia and xenolalia because um, there is issues here it's specifically in translation of the Bible so Acts 2 appears to be xenolalia but that seems to be very different from the experience described in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14 where Paul is speaking of a kind of heavenly language that can't be understood by anyone without that spiritual gift of interpretation. So most Pentecostal Christians and those in the charismatic movement see tongues as a divine prayer language that leads one to make an incomprehensible babbling kind of noise while simultaneously feeling close to God. So in an effort to reconcile Acts and Corinthians, some theologians have said that what's happening in Acts is not xenolalia. Rather, the apostles are speaking in a heavenly language and the Spirit of God was simultaneously giving listeners a miracle of interpretation. But that is a minority interpretation or a minority position. So having looked at tongues, we now look at prophecy. Again, I've mentioned a little bit about this already. So in the Bible, a prophet is someone who conveys the word of God in a direct way. Sometimes this has to do with foretelling future events, but more often it's got to do with speaking a message that will bring about greater loyalty to God, increased morality or a more worshipful attitude. So the charismatic movement view prophecy as a type of exhortation coming directly from God. Paul says that prophecies need to be tested and so for this reason churches have criteria to discern true from false prophecy. So these criteria would include um, checking the prophecy doesn't contradict the teachings of the Bible, it's got to be accepted by the leaders of the church, it's got to clearly recognise Jesus as God, it's got to inspire, it's got to inspire love, joy, peace and other fruits of the spirits just as the ones that are referred to up here in this passage from Galatians. The third um, way we can look at this um, is healing. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus commands the disciples to spread the gospel. And he also talks of a number of signs that will accompany this work, this evangelism. So these are signs of evangelism. And this is a key verse in Mark 16. Um, they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, many scholars, it should be noted, believe that chapter 16 is a later addition to Mark's gospel. So I just put that in there because I'm going to show you something in a minute that you might find interesting. When charismatic Christians have gathered, they fully expect that the Spirit of God can move to heal believers. They think this can happen through the prayers of elders and also through those that have spiritual gifts of healing. So healing is not just a physical but it could also be a psychological or a, it's got a psychological or emotional dimension. 
So it could mean the healing of relationships, buried memories or one's conscience. But I'm going to go back to this um, bit in Mark 16, because if you read on in Mark 16, uh, you get a bit more in Mark 16. Not only will they lay their hands on the sick, they will um, recover. They shall also, as it says here, take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shan't hurt them. And so this has led some Pentecostal churches to go even more literally. And that's why in some churches you will have people handling venomous snakes, believing they won't be bitten. And unfortunately, sometimes they are. And quite a few have died. So... I'll leave that for you to think about. Right, where are we going next? Ah, oh, yes, inspiration in worship. Now, charismatic services are centred around the expectation that the Spirit of God is going to do something. So worshippers generally feel free to move their bodies, sway with the music, raise hands in the air, clap, dance, link arms, you name it, they do it. Dance about. Usually your style of music is contemporary. There's a worship band there. They are services are not liturgical, and by mean they don't. By that I mean they don't really have a set form. There's not a, a an order of service that one follows rigidly. Many charismatics um, um, churches just project lyrics onto the screen so that worshippers uh, don't have to use books. Times of prayer can be punctuated with spontaneous singing. Songs can include can conclude with worshippers transitioning into speaking, singing, or speaking in tongues. Really, there is no set pattern. So it's examples of the sort of thing you might see if you went to a charismatics or even a Pentecostalist service. So let's look at some of the arguments in favour of the charismatic movement. So one thing you can say about it, it's grown massively and fast. Now, 9% of the world's population, 27% of Christians are, ca are charismatics. It's without doubt good at converting people to, charis uh, to Christianity. Charismatic and Pente Pentecostal denominations are growing at a far faster rate than the Church of England, which is dying out, as we saw when we looked at the effect of um, immigration, etc. Um, if miracles are real, then you've got amazing evidence that point people towards believing in God. You can't argue when you've experienced a miracle. Um, it's certainly lively, engaging, fun and interactive. So it appeals to the younger generation. And then festivals such as Soul Survivor enhance that even more. Uh, it's good at drawing in people from different races and displaying ethnic diversity. There are lots of ethnic minority charismatic churches. And arguably, you could say it's more true to the Christianity laid out in the Bible uh, than what we see in traditional church worship. So let's look at some of the challenges to the charismatic movement. So one of the appeals of the charismatic movement that is in contrast to having mere knowledge about God from a theological or philosophical perspective Charismatic believers claim to have direct experience of God's presence. So Christian churches do not accept every claim of a charismatic experience as true. Churches have a set criteria to judge experiences. So the fact that churches have tests suggests that at least sometimes these experiences are not coming from God at all, but perhaps from other spiritual forces or generated by the believer's own ego. So a much wider question can be asked. Is it possible that none of these experiences come from God? So charismatic experiences would seem to provide empirical evidence for the existence of God. Miraculous experiences, healing, speaking languages, previous unknown to believers would all count as evidence for this. But let's look at it from a philosophical perspective. And you should have covered a little bit of this in philosophy. And this is the idea of how you decide whether something's true. And there's two principles basically at work in philosophy, which is the verification principle and the falsification principle. Now, the verification principle was put forward by this man, A.J. Eyre, and he said that knowledge outside of formally true statements, i.e. analytic statements, such as two plus two is four, well, we know that, the only way you can show whether that knowledge is true or false is if you verify it empirically through sense experience. So, for instance, I am wearing glasses. You can tell whether that statement was true or false. You can see that I'm wearing glasses.
So if you can't show something to be empirically true, A.J. Eyre thought it was meaningless. In other words, can't be shown to be true. It's unverifiable. Anthony Flew said slightly differently, what makes something meaningful is whether or not it can be falsified. So he thought that in an order for a statement to be taken as meaningful, there's got to exist some condition where if it is said to exist, the assertion would be false. So what Flew was basically saying, without the ability to falsify claims, science can't proceed. And he thought this was sometimes something quite often religious believers do. They um, refuse to have their beliefs falsified under any situations. Every time something else crops up, they find another, another reason, another excuse as to why their beliefs still hold true, constantly moving the goalposts. You make your own decisions about that, but bear these two ideas in mind as we look for, through some of the criticisms of charismatic worship. So let's dig a big deep, little, let's dig a little bit deeper here. Let's look at tongues. Acts 2 tells the disciples speak in languages they've not learned, so Xenolalia. This was interpreted by those present who spoke the languages that they spoke. So there were people present who said, oh, how can this be? They speak in the language of the Greeks, the Medes, the Persians, etc. So the Persians, Medes, Greeks there, who could translate the language, the, the language that was being spoken by these fishermen from Nazareth. So although this is the kind of evidence that could be verified in theory, the account comes to us in only one ancient religious document and there's no outside confirmation other than what is written by the writer in Acts, which as we know is Luke, who is a believer who travels around with Paul. So the charismatic movement has sometimes included claims of Xenolalia, but these have never been confirmed by any scientific studies. Most current accounts of speaking in tongues are of heavenly language known only to God. So in this experience, the speaker uses what, sound, you know, uses what sounds like nonsense syllables. Often this form of tongues is not interpreted, but when an interpretation is given, there's absolutely no way to verify a relationship between the interpretation and the language it was supposedly based on. So what I'm basically saying here is there's no physical way to prove that these experiences come from God. So AJ I would say they're meaningless, they can't be verified. If we look at healing, claims regarding healing are difficult to verify. When someone experiences a dramatic improvement in their health, some Christians might be tempted to credit the prayer for healing. However, there are difficulties with doing so. Some diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, are known to have symptoms that come and go erratically. There are reports of healings which, when followed up, find the patient is just as ill or worse off. Claims of miraculous cures of cancer through prayer have been made when cancer was merely a medical hypothesis rather than proven by a biopsy. So therefore the one cured may not have had cancer in the first place. Spontaneous remission from disease is rare, but sometimes does happen outside of prayers for healing. So it doesn't necessarily mean that prayer is the cause of it. And no scientifically conducted study has yet proven a correlation between prayers for healing and actual healing. So again, not verified. Sometimes those in the charismatic movement will make the claim that if someone isn't physically healed, then there's still been an emotional or psychological kind of healing. In other words, a miracle's taken place whether or not there's been a physical healing. Now, Anthony Flew would argue that this sounds like a claim that can't ever be falsified, and that therefore makes the thing meaningless. And of course, there have been examples of clear fakery. So this man here, George Popoff, an American televangelist, was exposed in 1986 for using a concealed earpiece to receive radio messages from his wife, who gave him the names and addresses and ailments of audience members during the Popoff-led religious services. 
Popoff was falsely claiming that God revealed this information to him so he could cure them through faith healing. He was banned from televangelism for a period of time and then he's now back on the uh, back on televangelism with a massive uh, a massive following selling as we can see free miracle spring water invited people to come in buy it and give him their money make what you want out of that one so perhaps the strongest scientific claim that's been made about religious experience is there's a correlation between religious participation and physical and emotional health so there's been scientifically conducted studies which could demonstrate the benefits of belonging to a religion but those studies aren't limited to charismatic forms of christianity it's all religion so again that wouldn't appear to weigh out. now there are natural explanations as well for charismatic experiences I mean, those who have charismatic experiences are convinced that these are caused by the Holy Spirit. But are there alternative explanations? One such explanation can be seen in this idea of cultural phenomenon. Now, we know that your culture and your cultural context plays a dramatic role in religious experience. So if you're raised in a geographical area that's been influenced by Christianity, you're more likely to have an experience of, of Jesus than Krishna. But the opposite's true in India. If you're raised in India, you're more likely to have a religious experience that involves Krishna rather than Jesus. Cross-cultural studies have shown that traditions other than Christianity have experiences which may be the same or close to the Christian practice of tongues. In cultures where Christianity has been prevalent, speaking in tongues is viewed as a sign of the Holy Spirit. But in other cultures, there would be a different understanding of the power behind these experiences. So this doesn't rule out the existence of a transcendent realm, but it challenges claims that see the origin of these experiences in a specifically Christian way. And of course, I could go back to um, John Hick there um, before I move on to this next bit. Because if we look at how he thought about pluralism, we could just be all those people would just be experiencing the one true reality that he talked about. Anyway, let's look at some other um, explanations. Psychology and sociology offer naturalistic explanations for charismatic gifts. Um, psychology would argue that we live in a world full of anxiety and neediness. And this means that some people may be especially open to experiences which ease that anxiety and meet their emotional needs. Doesn't matter how questionable the belief associated with those experiences are, provided the need is met, they'll go for it. Freud, this man here, viewed religion as an illusion based on our primal need for a father figure. So perhaps the absence of relational support in one's life makes one especially prone to a charismatic experience. Sociologists note how nature and society are chaotic, chaotic so humans need rules in order to survive. Society needs to give as much force to these rules as possible, so it uses religion to do this. So religion has been society's way of stating how important these rules are. This man here, Emile Durkheim, equated God with society. He said God wants us to live this way it can be translated as society wants us to live this way. Now, according to all these views, the experiences of those in the charismatic movement are projections onto the universe of our human needs, problems, longings, etc. So in other words, people have religious experiences because they need to have them, regardless of their ultimate truth value. So this conclusion takes on an especially negative tone when those who are especially weak and needy are seen as being in more need of these experiences than others. So according to this view, those with charismatic experiences are weaker human beings with more psychological and social needs than the average human being. But there are other explanations for charismatic experiences. Just as with all religious experiences, it's possible to criticise charismatic phenomena by saying they're just the products of people getting hyped up or deluding themselves. Similarly, the phenomena could be explained reductively as a result of a chemical change in the brain, perhaps brought on by suggestion or excitement.
you could explain the charismatic phenomena in terms of coincidences. Selection bias is when you notice things that you're disposed to notice because you're looking out for them and they interpret reality accordingly. So charismatics will look out for answers to prayer so much that when coincidences happen, they spot them straight away and convince their miracles. Now, to give you an example of this, I, this is a genuinely true story. When I was a student many years ago, I lived in a student house and in my student house, there was a, a guy called Tim, who was a very charismatic Christian. And there was another guy called Dave, who was a confirmed atheist. And it was a Saturday night and Dave wanted to go downtown to see his girlfriend and couldn't get it and needed a taxi and could not book a taxi. Uh, all of them were full up and he was furious. And he turned to Tim, and I remember this very well, he turned to Tim and said, if God is so effing fantastic, why don't you make it so that when I walk out of the front door, a bloody taxi comes down the road so I can go and see my girlfriend. And he stormed out of the house and he walked out of the front door. And as he walked out the front door, an empty taxi came down the street. Now, as far as Tim, the Christian, was concerned, that was God. That was a miracle. That was God answering his prayers. As far as Dave was concerned, that was coincidence. You make of it what you will. It genuinely happened. So we could also argue that charismatics could all be in a conspiracy together to lie about the things they've experienced. More sinisterly, the big charismatic leaders could be con artists who exploit people's gullibility and belief in order to manipulate them into following the leaders and giving them money. Now, Darren Brown did a TV show. You can go and uh, there's, it's on YouTube. Go and have a look for it, uh, where he showed that just by using the power of suggestion and techniques of charismatic leaders, he could persuade some people that God was real. Very interesting program. So back to the idea of psychology and auto suggestion. A number of arguments, however, can be put forward to defend the reduction of charismatic experiences to psychological or sociological factors. So let's look at the other side of the coin now. So I think we have to say these people can't all be lunatics. The sheer number of people who have charismatic experiences mean that a broad cross section of society is involved, claiming that all people who have these experiences are especially needy or psychologically deficient, doesn't fit with the huge diversity in the movement. And of course, that hasn't been verified scientifically either. So I think actually it's a weak argument. Um, this is an interesting one. You can say the brain's evolved without saying it originates in the brain. So those with charismatic experience could say that though the brain plays a role in interpreting the experience, the experience is caused outside one's brain. So the fact that these experiences happen in different cultures could be seen, as I said previously, in supporting John Hicks' view that there's one divine reality that's refracted by different cultures. Remember that prism. These experiences are part of a cumulative case for God. So whilst there's no scientifically proven evidence of miraculous in the charismatic movement, it could be argued that there is some weight to the fact that tens of millions of people have unusual experiences that bring them joy, happiness, a positive social experience and renewed confidence to live their lives. And the philosopher Richard Swinburne says that in itself is a compelling case for God's existence just based on this cumulative evidence. Hopefully you have found that informative.